officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. May the 8th, 1945. Britain rejoices. Germany, the chief enemy who sought to crush her, has been totally defeated. The British people demonstrate their thankfulness that the greater part of their grim work is done. more months of war in the Far East, where the Japanese still defy the might of the United Nations. But soon the crumbling Japanese Empire crashes to its doom, and once more Britain celebrate. This time they welcome peace. Once again, history records how man's high endeavor won a great and glorious victory. How right will always triumph over might. How the spirit of a people with something to fight for, something to work for, with freedom and liberty to live for, never allowed them to falter for a moment on the hard road they had to follow to the end and to victory. The United Nations meet in London. Their task is to set the seal on triumphs dearly won. This surely typifies man's high endeavor. Three simple words, words upon which progress, success, and even life itself may well depend. And so, naturally a little hesitant, we return to the ways of peace, hardly believing yet that our sacrifices are about to be rewarded. But at least we know what we want, a lasting peace, industrial prosperity, freedom in all things for our children, houses to live in, plenty of food, clothing and toys in the shops, leisure and security for all our people. We can have all these things if we take our chance now to lay the firm foundations of happiness and prosperity, if we are prepared for a little longer to make that same self-sacrifice, to make that high endeavor which carried us to victory. And what a great part endeavor plays in a successful life, not only on the serious side, but on the lighter, in sport, for example. The Oval, an excitement as high as Hutton nears Bradman's record. Can he beat it? That's the question. And there's a tense air of expectancy as the crowd waits. Yes, he's done it, and with a beautiful late cut down to third man, and the crowd goes mad. Bradman's total is passed by young Len Hutton of Yorkshire, 336, and he's still there. Westcott kicks off for the Wolves to start the most sensational cup final for years. The surprise of the 100,000 present, not to mention the Wolves, it's Portsmouth who started attacking almost from the whistle. And Scott, the Wolves goalie, has all he can do to keep these Pompey forwards out. He leaves an open goal, but Taylor covers and clears. Then a second later, Morgan sends it up to Barrow, and it's a goal.
Billy Woodison is after the world half-mile record. Running from scratch, he has six pacemakers in front of him, including his brother, S.J., who's out of the picture at present, with a start of 85 yards. With powerful stride and perfect rhythm, Sidney Woodison bears down upon the men in front and also on that world record of 1 minute 49.6 seconds set up by the American Elroy Robinson last year. One by one, the pacemakers are passed and left behind, all except his brother. A burst of speed for the finish and four yards behind SJ, SC competes the half mile, 0.4 of a second faster than anyone has run it before. Noisel continually bores in. He's always been able to take it, and his best work is done at close quarters. But the British champion is cool and clever. He returns Noisel's punches with interest, and he's got a left. The sensation comes in the third round. A right to the jaw rocks the German, then a beautiful left quickly followed up sends Noisel down. While the card is in progress, he signals to his seconds, and it's all over by the shouting. how a west wind influences a boat race, picking up the surface of the river and making it poply. That's the technical term. These conditions are supposed to help Oxford, who are the heavier crew. And as they race past us, the dark blues, surely enough, have established an early lead. This, no doubt, is their plan, hoping to get sufficiently ahead by Hammersmith to cross over into Cambridge's water. At Harrods, a mile and a quarter on their way, Oxford still has their lead, but Cambridge is steadily reducing it. You can gauge the distance between the two crews, about half a length. And when they shoot Hammersmith Bridge, Oxford have failed to establish their clear lead, so that the turn on the river now swings the advantage to Cambridge. Back on the launch, following the boats, to watch the crucial stage of the race. Oxford rowing the slower stroke around the outside of the bend, although nearer the camera. For one minute, to the thrill of their supporters, Cambridge get their nose in front, but the prospect of victory fades away as the river straightens out and begins to favour Oxford. Those were pre-war newsreel pictures of high endeavour applied to sport. But here we see the highest form of endeavour, to risk one's life in safeguarding the lives of others. How can we, who have been given the task of restoring happiness to the world, live up to the sacrifices already made for us? Our endeavours may not be so spectacular, but one certain course is open to us. We can help to get all we want for ourselves and for others, for our friends, families, husbands, wives and children, by increasing our eventual spending power and persuading others to do the same. National savings is the answer. Let our high endeavour be support for our savings groups. On such a foundation we can build a happy and prosperous world, now and for the generations to come.